So hello everybody and welcome to the um, general meeting. Uh, today's date is the 7th of June and we have um, a lot of stuff to cover today, some very exciting topics. So without further ado, I am going to uh, move through the agenda. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So today we're going to focus on a little bit about the membership and reminders because there we're having some problems with emails, so more practical stuff. And then we're delighted to introduce the uh, steering committee. If you remember, there was some um, voting recently and there were two new members and three re-elected members. So we're going to get each of those to come on and actually introduce themselves. A little update on the change control board. Paul is going to do a, a very quick verbal update on the, um, the exchange mechanism. Brian's going to talk about ICHE 6R3, and then we're going to have a panel about unblinding documents. So um, how you manage unblinding documents and have um, uh, three experts who will come in and talk about what they're doing within their company um, and ready to answer all your questions. So uh, the first thing, just to remind you, we are a great community. Uh, we have 324 people that are active members. We have 1,477 people who get emails regularly. Now, this is the piece that we're going to focus on because we have 1,477 subscribed, but doesn't mean to say that all those emails are going through. Um, our LinkedIn group keep, keeps growing, 3,500 people. Um, so don't forget to go to our reference model. If anybody is new to this meeting, um, say hi in the chat. Welcome. Um, it's always nice to, to see that there's new people joining us. Um, you can always go to our website, um, tmfrefmodel.com, um, and get some information from there if you want. So, a reminder, if you click unsubscribe, you don't get anything further. And so, therefore, um, if, you, if you actually don't want to get anything from TMF Reference Model, go in and actually delete your account. It's probably the better thing to do. Um, and if your email changes, please, please, please change your email address. Um, and that's why we have, we have more than 150 delivery failures at the moment. So please do change your email address um, and put a photo in. It's always nice to see what people look like. I know uh, we always spend our lives on computers waving from, from computer screens, but it's nice to have a photo in the system as well. And hi to everybody who's saying hello, that's fantastic. Um, just another quick reminder from me, I only get to do the really exciting, boring stuff. Um, if you don't know when the next meeting is, go on to our website, tmfreferencemodel.com, down the bottom. That's got all the meeting details there. And if you click on the meeting details, you will see it will allow you to add it to the calendar. If you're in Groups IO, you can have it. It's on the calendar as well. So please make sure that you find out where the meetings are um, and you're up to date with all that sort of thing. So... That's the, the, the boring logistics over. Um, the next piece um, is a much more interesting. So I would like to introduce you to the people who are new to the committee and the people who have been re-elected to the committee. So I am going to ask them to come on camera. So Joanne, can I start with you, please? Um, you are new to the committee and I would be grateful if you could just do a bit of an introduction, your background and what you've been doing up until now with the reference model. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Joanne Malia. I head up the TMF at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Um, prior to joining the steering committee, I worked on the change control board. Um, my background is pretty varied. I have worked for CROs, I worked for a diagnostic firm, I've worked for small biotech and medium-sized pharma and even big pharma. Um, I've worked in Europe, so I sort of understand that um, side of the pond a little bit better than maybe some of my other North American colleagues. Um, but happy to be part of the steering committee. And if you have any questions or want to get in touch with me, just email me. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Joanne. And to our other new member, Jill, um, I can't see you on camera at the moment, but if you could come on and say hi. Ah, oh, there you are. Yeah. 
Hello everyone, um, my name is Jill Gittens. I am currently Director of eStrategy, eClinical Strategy and Solutions. I know it's a bit of a mouthful um, at TransPerfect, just responsible for basically um, making sure that the processes that we have at TransPerfect are done to a high quality, um, responsible um, for our subject matter experts group and our TMF quality group, which is an independent group. I've been involved with the reference model um, for a very, very long time. I remember going through the first um, versions with Karen on many a plane ride. Um, and looking at different different TMF structures um, and then kind of left that part of it and came back. So delighted to be re-involved um, and really, really excited about some of the initiatives coming up. I don't want to steal your thunder, but I know that we are working on um, things to do with the website um, and some other exciting things. So very excited to be part of it again. Fantastic. Thanks, Jill. And then, of course, we have the people who have been re-elected to the committee and coming from the Northern Lights... Um, I'm assuming you're up north at the moment, uh, Mr. Paul Fenton. Um, you, uh, thank you, Karen. Yes, I, I am up north, uh, north of the border. Um, so really happy to have been re-elected again. I think this is my third term, maybe fourth term, I'm not sure. But it seems like quite a long time, but it's great to be part of this really dynamic group uh, and lots of really interesting stuff uh, on the horizon. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for voting for me. Brilliant, thanks, Paul. And of course, the whiz, Cathy Clark. Can you introduce yourself, please, Cathy? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cathy Clark, and I am product director for CTMS and ETMF at NOV. I've also, like Paul, been at part of the group for three or four election cycles now, and I've participated in a number of great initiatives. Uh, at my company and outside the, of, of that, my company, I've also been participating a lot in cross-functional um, initiatives with, for example, regulatory. So uh, the RIM reference model and so on. So I'm interested in bringing in um, a little bit broader perspective in some places on how ETF can be part of a larger ecosystem. Fantastic, thanks, Kathy. And I'm going to do the last introduction. Hold on, I need to be on the right page so I can click of Russell Joyce. He couldn't be here today because he is doing running a training course. Uh, Russell is um, a owner of Heath Barrett Consulting. He has a tremendous background in archiving and records management and again has been on the steering committee. I think this is his second time around on the steering committee. So the steering committee, if anybody's interested, there's a charter um, which is, can be downloaded from the website. And basically you have three year um, periods where you're on the on, where you're on the the reference model steering committee and then you can stand for re-election or new people can come in so very excited to present the steering committee if anybody wants to know who the current steering committee is in total it's all on the website as well so that's the update on the steering committee um, we also wanted to give a quick update on the change control board and joanne you'll notice that i actually added in who the chairs were to your slide i hope you don't mind um, but if you could just give a, a quick update, or is Kelly giving the update? I think Kelly's giving the update. Oh, fantastic. Kelly, apologies. I thought it was Joanne. So Kelly. Oh, no problem. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so yeah, just a quick update on the change control board. Since um, Joanne was the co-lead with me for, for many years, um, she will be missed, but I think she's going to be a great addition to the steering committee. Um, we have... Um, Layla Ponce, who's joining us from CGEN. So she will be my um, partner in crime going forward. Um, so one of the initiatives that we're working on um, with the steering committee as well is to look at the zone team's participation, how we can get a little bit more participation from everybody, how we can get you more involved. We know right now some of you involved in the zone teams um, perhaps don't really get too much information. You only get hit up perhaps when we have a change request. So we are looking to appoint a new zone team liaison that'll be part of the steering, um, part of the change control board and find ways to get you guys in the zone teams more involved other than just when you have a change request. Um, you probably saw I sent out a bunch of emails, um, you know, messages through your zone team um, uh, the zone team websites, just asking to make sure you still want to be involved. And we will be putting out a call for more people um, and some zone team leads as soon as we get this new, um, you know, working model um, uh, created. 
So stay tuned, very exciting things to come. Fantastic, thanks very much, Kelly. Sorry about the slight confusion as to who was presenting. No worries. So, um, fantastic. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the EMS. So Paul, I just put your name on here. If you could give us a quick update on the EMS, I'd greatly appreciate it. Ah, you didn't, um, you didn't get my slide. Nice. No, but I'm sure you can just do a wonderful job there. Okay, all right. So, so I, I had I had prepared a slide that obviously got lost uh, somewhere between Canada and the UK. Yeah, uh, sorry, but, my inbox. Um, sorry. No, no problem. Um, so I just wanted to um, quickly talk about a webinar we did. I believe it was last week, May 27th, um, where we spoke a, a little bit about the survey results that we had. Um, uh, analyzed, but also we had a panel discussion, which was very interesting. Um, we had a representative from uh, a sponsor organization, a representative from a CRO, and then also a representative from uh, a vendor. Um, and so we were just talking about it from those different perspectives. You know, how would you go about implementing um, the exchange mechanism standard? Um, you know, who, who should play which role, et cetera? And then what, what were some of the challenges? And then also how do we see the future? Um, so if anybody's interested in listening to that webinar, especially the panel discussion, which is the second half of it, um, it's been published on the, um, the Reference Model YouTube channel. Um, so you can just go and, uh, and, and look at it on the YouTube channel, um, or you can just Google uh, Exchange Mechanism Standard, uh, click on Videos in Google, in Google, and you'll see it will come up as number one uh, in the search results. Um, also, if anybody wants... Uh, any information about the EMS. So if you want to download the specification or just read about it, um, there is a web page on the um, reference model website. So tmfrefmodel.com forward slash EMS for exchange mechanism standard. And then finally, um, we know that uh, a lot of organizations are currently thinking about, well, how do I, how do, how do I go about implementing this? Um, so if anybody has any questions or needs any any advice on, on how best to, to put in place uh, an implementation program for the EMS, um, feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, and I believe our contact information is also on the website. And that was it. That was Fantastic. That, and, and Paul, well, I, I hopefully I'll get the slide at some stage. Maybe you could just try resend it and I'll insert it. I will, it. I will. And we can include it because there are links in there as well. Yeah, so. yeah. That, that's what I figured as you were talking. So it'll go in the deck and the deck will then go up on the um, on the reference model web model website, we can get a link to the YouTube account and um, put that on to um, uh, the yeah, reference yeah. model website as well. And it may already be the case. I need to check with Eldon. Eldon's very efficient, so I imagine it probably is already the case. But if it is, okay. we can do that. No worries at all. Thank, Thank you. you very very much. Okay, so let's move on and talk about ICH E6R3. Fran, I am going to hand it over to you and I have got your polls up and um, you will have to explain that I took away three of your letters from I didn't I didn't know what to do so I just <laughs> it's in true time it's in true time so okay. hey everybody we could spend six hours talking about E6R3 but this is just a quick overview of the overview and there are many polls to take a finger, put a finger on a pulse of this community and find out how much you want us to be. So I can launch the polls for you. One second, let me launch the polls. So they should be launched now, Fran, the first two so ones. First two polls, when you think about ICAG6, do your eyes glaze over? Do you know and love it? Give us a, a finger on the pulse of what you think of ICAG6 and then how aware are you of the upcoming revision three? Lovely. I'm Thank going you. to share the results. There you go. Beautiful. The essential documents table. Of course, this community knows the essential documents table because that's what we started the reference model off, right? Um, hard look when revision two came out. And revision two was really rich in TMF information. If this community likes, we could do an, uh, a re of what happened with R2, but it's R3 that we're talking about. And I love that at least 10% of you know too many facts, TMF, about ICAG6. Um, if you can scroll down a bit, Karen, I can't see the results for poll two. 
Um, so I can't. I'm going to scroll down. Why? Right. Yeah. You need to scroll down. On your to-do list. That is very helpful to know. So I blow through this material relatively quickly. Um, it, only 12% of you have not yet been aware that ICHE 6 is under revision. So that's the point of why we're with you today. Go to the next slide, Karen. Slide. So the ICH expert working group is hard at work updating E6. E6 is topic number six of GCP. And we all know that section eight has the essential documents table. Um, revision R3 means revision three, and we've got acronyms listed there. The expert working group is made up of global inspectors and their health authority co-workers. GCP is good clinical practice. Let's all remember it's GCP, not perfect clinical practice. No, never PCP. It's good clinical practice is good enough. Revision three is being crafted and drafted right now. Go on, Karen. The um, clinical trial transparency, no, transformation initiative worked with the ICH expert working group to come out to the public with two really beautiful webinars. Um, the intent of the expert working group is to make sure that the entire universe of clinical trialists, everybody involved gets a say, gets a seat at the table, is has their voice heard as they're <clears throat> revising E6. The webinar's description, there's a link there. I've got many, many links in the slides to follow. The intent of this work, the intent of this outreach is to get the experiences of all the affected stakeholders so they can come out with E6 that reflects our current universe and, and what we do to run clinical trials. So it, it's critical for everybody in TMF, everybody in clinical research to chime in now. Share these messages across your sponsor organizations, your CRO organizations, your site organizations. Next slide. So the expert working group is looking to get all of these divergent perspectives across the various life cycle states of clinical trials and all of the stakeholders, the participants, their docs, their nurses, the sites, the sponsors, the CROs, the vendors, the e-clinical, the everything, health authorities, and all the trial organizations. Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, they held two public webinars with two different flavors on May 18th and May 19th. And really thankfully to the pandemic, they didn't hold these face to face. They held them as live public um, webinars and the recordings were captured. And the end of this presentation has all those links. A formal draft of revision three is gonna come out perhaps early to mid 22. It's impossible to know yet because they haven't made a commitment on the timing, but what they are committing to is taking all of the stakeholder feedback that they get. So again, dial into this, share this with your organizations, have your voice, make sure you get heard and watch out, make yourselves linked in to the CTTI website so that you can be informed of when more comes from the expert working group. That's a quote from them. Engagement is at the heart of this revision process. Go ahead, Ms. Karen. Links here. The Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative has a project dedicated people working on this stuff with the expert working group. The webinar overview and recordings are in that second link. A synopsis of the webinars is in the third link. And hey folks, the overview and their materials says that the webinars happen June 4th and 5th. It's the 7th, the webinars happened in May. They make mistakes too. We're all human. It's good clinical practice, not perfect. Roll on Karen. Thank you, ma'am. Look, bear in mind it always, always, always when you're prepping for inspection, the people showing up are humans funded by our tax dollars. Their QRG code on the CTGI website had a little tiny, um, what is that? Dinosaur. So uh, bear in mind that we're all in this together and we're all working this together. I just love that they put a little dinosaur in their QRG. Keep going. So I just end this up with too many famous acronyms as a helpful list for you all. Quality by design and risk management is the jam for R3. If you haven't been aware of the risk management plan that they buried in R2, 
get aware now, they're doubling down. They're not lessening the requirement for trialists to become expert in risk management and quality by design. We have time ahead of the curve for R3 to get ourselves more expert in those practices, practices in good clinical practice, not perfect clinical practice. We're running experiments on humans, so we need to manage the risk. E6 is hard materials. They're not written very simply, so it, it's good to work them with colleagues. It's good to work them many, many times. And it is hard work, but it's so worth it. And that leads us to our last poll. Which I will launch right the second. So the question for you all is how much ICH E6 talk would you like in these public meetings? So we're happy to come back to you and give you updates. We're happy to talk more about revision two. We're happy to talk more about, we'll talk about this all day long. It's not directly related to TMF. It's directly related to running clinical trials. The end result of clinical trials is all the records. So we're happy to talk about it and we're happy to shut up about it. I don't, more think, I, I don't think shut up is the right answer though. In the night, <laughs> sorry, that sounds terrible, but you know what I mean. Last plug for Vax pins. So Fran, what would you guess is going to come out as the highest? Um, only cover when there's R3 news and survey sets. Not yet. I'm, let, I'm literally going to get three called two thirds of the people voting. Uh, that's it. I've got it. I've done it. Well, you've done it. I haven't done it. Okay. You've done it, my darling. So I'm going to end the poll. And Marion, if you could take a snip of it, that would be fantastic. Woo! Hey, man. Good coffee. So clearly, there's a lot of interest in ICHE 6R3 in the sense that, you know, so that. It, 40, sorry, 38% of people said they actually wanted in every meeting, even when there's no news. Yeah, so we, I can do put, think, we can put links in the back of the deck, Karen, and not even talk yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, but sometimes it's nice just to even say, just as a reminder, nothing's sure. changed. Um, and if anybody does, because one of the things I'd say about ICHE 6 or 3 is it, it's, it's, it's something that um, we are, as individuals, very linked into it in different companies, but not necessarily as a reference model group at the moment. Um, so anybody who wants to contribute, they can they, they can come be part of this meeting. Um, one of the things I would say is that we like to run these meetings with lots of information coming from the attendees as well. So thank you very much, Fran. Anything else to add on that? No, nope. thank you. Great. OK. And as Alison's pointed out, the sessions are three hours. So get either a very big cup of coffee, a nice glass of wine, a beer, a cocktail, um, whatever it is to keep you going, because they are long sessions. And I must admit that there are some bits of it that were very interesting and some bits that were slightly less interesting for me. So um, it's, but definitely worth watching. Excellent. OK. So now before we go into the next section, what we want to do today is we're going to have two things. One was we're going. I'm going to bring on three experts, and we're going to have panel, and we're going to specifically focus on unblinding documents. It's a topic that's come up a lot um, in terms of, and we can really dig into it today. I think in terms of how companies um, manage them, what they're doing, what the challenges are, what the regulators have said, what people have seen in inspections. And I would love you guys. I mean, there's 152 of you on this call. Take, be part of this, put your comments in. If you want to, this is just a Zoom call. You can come and you know, put your camera on um, and um, uh, come and have a chat, ask a question, just post your question and I'll sort of manage the questions coming in. But the other thing I would say is that, you know, we've got, we, we do have half an hour left in this meeting and this isn't just about unblinding documents. So if there's a question that you'd like to ask about the TMF reference model or associated, feel free to post the question in as well, because you've got most of the steering committee on here, you've got a huge number of TMF experts on here. So please do, do um, um, be part of this, ask, this is, this is a great opportunity to get a live answer from lots of people who know lots of different things about TMS. So uh, my panel, and I'd like to, well, they're probably on camera now, hang on a second, I need to actually find where, the cam where my camera's gone. Um, it's Mary Emanuel from Pfizer and Paul Fenton from Montreum and Alison Vajavandi from Estella. So actually, can I start by Mary, Paul and Alison, can you just do a quick introduction 
um, so people know who you are, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Aminoyal. I head the TMF operations team at Pfizer, uh, and I'm participating on this panel because we recently revised our practice around unblinded documents. Fantastic. Paul, I know you've introduced yourself, but more why you're, and you're muted. Right, you're still muted, Paul. Paul, 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 you're still muted. Sorry, okay, I'll start again. So ah, Paul again. Fenton, um, uh, unmuted this time. So I'm the, the uh, CEO of Montreal. Um, and so I get involved in blinding or unblinding aspects more from a vendor um, standpoint, but I also in my early career worked for about five years in the whole world of IRT and randomization. Um, so got involved a lot in the whole sort of process around blinding of information and unblinding and managing that information uh, during the, the life of the study. So hopefully I can give you some technology uh, perspectives. Fantastic. And last but not least, Alison. Yeah, hi, I'm Alison Barjabandi and I head up the Central Medical File Group out of Stellis. And uh, we probably like most companies uh, moved from a paper TMF model to an ETMF and, and what went along with that were some challenges of how do we manage the unblinded records. And so that's why I was very interested to be on this panel today. Fantastic, thank you very, very much. Um, so if you would like to say something, you can either flash your mute button on and off and hopefully I'll see it, or you can, I think you can put your hand up and raise your hand. You could put your hand up, can't you, in Zoom? Um, oh, hang on a second, I've just lost my polls. There you go. Um, so if you, want to, if you want to join in, please do. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a very simple poll, which is, where do you store your unblinded TMF documents? And I would love it if as many of possible of you could answer this poll, because I think what we really want to know is what are we, what's the industry doing? And again, Marion, thank you very much if you can take the answers to the polls when I share them. Um, and um, if you've said somewhere completely different, I'd really appreciate it if you could actually put in the chat where or come on and chat and talk to us about it. So I'm going to wait till we get to 100. Um, we're nearly there. Obviously, some of you might not have ETMFs, in which case the question isn't particularly relevant. Um, and actually, before I do, so Mary, Paul, Alison, what would your vote be on the answer to this? Separate electronic. Yeah, me too. Ours are right <laughs> in the ETMF. But what would you say the industry would say? Oh. Hmm. ETMF. Interesting. So I'm going to end the polling. <laughs> we are we are at 65. We're, we are at uh, nearly 70% of the people have voted. So thank you very much, guys. I'm going to end the polling. And I'm going to share the results. And I'm actually surprised. Wow. That. Yeah. I That's was good. not <laughs> expecting that many people to say that they store their, their documents in the ETMF. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. And I do, yeah, I do think the uh, restricted access or using the security levels really aids in that. There are challenges to it, though, of course, but um, maybe that's why the reasons people put it yeah. in TMF nowadays, yeah. so high. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, and I'm gonna to come to each of you to explain how, what models you've seen and how you do it, etc. So I'm now gonna, I'm gonna stop the sharing. I'm gonna ask one more question because I think this is quite useful as well. So this is the timing. So everyone said, lots of people said, they put it in their ETMF. So my question now is if you answered and there were 97 people who answered, um, of which I think there were 65 who said ETMF. So I'm expecting 65 people to answer this. Um, if you store them, when do you add them? 
because obviously if you break the blind at the end of the study it's slightly different to putting them in on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. go on then mary paul allison what do you think else is going to be uh i'm hoping is ongoing ongoing i think so. <laughs> <laughs> mary yep i would say ongoing okay well, somehow I've managed to get more people than have ETMFs um, answer the question. So that's fantastic. And the answer is? Yes, that's good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's fabulous. That's fabulous. We have nothing that's to say. I mean, there's nothing to discuss. We're all good. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot to discuss. So what I'd like to do now, if you don't mind, is if we can go through all three of you and 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 um actually it might be better for mary to go first then alison then you paul because you're talking about from a technology perspective and yeah. maybe you can sort of back up what everyone's been saying plus experiences you've had as well so mary can we start with you at pfizer how do you uh, manage you said you've changed your process recently how do you manage your um, unblinded documents so it's it's interesting when you ask those questions because for us it's it's all of the above really. So we have the option to store directly in the ETMF and some groups do that, uh, but the technology, and Paul, this goes to you, our current technology has a few limitations um, that make the security around the blinded documents dependent on having the correct answer from the document submitter. And as we manage the risk around some of those documents, study teams will make a decision about whether unblinded documents will be managed directly in the ETMF throughout the course of the study, or if they'll be managed in a separate repository and then brought through at final tables. Um, and we do have a mix. So some of the groups who have robust practices and we're confident that they're going to mark the documents correctly as being uh, potentially unblinding, that um, those will flow through. And then other groups uh, manage in a separate repository. What has changed for us is that we used to allow study teams to choose their separate repository. And for the most part, people would choose SharePoint and they would have lots of documents flowing through to SharePoint with not a lot of control and limited um, access review. So we recently implemented a validated regulated repository for temporarily storing unblinding documents until we reach the final tables milestone. This approach allows us to mimic the ETMF structure outside of our official uh, ETMF and then we flow those documents through uh, once we hit that milestone. We also have ways to better manage um, and audit access so we, we can more easily manage who is accessing, but we can also now see when documents are read. So if we need to look at, well, who actually looked at this particular document at any point in time, we can do that as well. Uh, in the future, we will implement more robust electronic controls in directly in our ETMF and in 2022, early 23, we'll shift everything over. Um, but we wanted to have a level of confidence that the controls are foolproof and there's no chance that somebody is pushing a document through that is unblinding that isn't marked as such. So, so that's why we have this, this two-pronged approach right now. Okay. Very interesting. I've got a couple of questions I'll come back to, but I think I'd like to go around everybody and then, because uh, there's a couple of sort of principal questions I think we need to get to. So, Alison, um, what about as a status? What do you do there? Yeah, um, we manage the unblinded uh, security by the end user security. So the end, years, end user is set up with unblinded access uh, and they have rights to see those records, upload those records. Uh, the interesting part, like Mary mentioned, where the end users make that decision on, is it blinded or unblinded when they upload? What we did with our security is if they're an unblinded end user, it automatically defaults to unblinded records so they don't have to make that choice. Um, and so that that's one way that we managed it. Uh, one of the challenges we do have with uh, 
um, blinded records is for our internal employees, they have access to all the studies within the ETMF and our external partners, uh, CRO members, uh, all have access by study. So externally, it's easier to manage who has blinded access versus unblinded access. Internally, we struggle with that. So if you have an unblinded study manager at the pharma company, they have to almost just work on unblinded studies because you, you can't have them blinded on an unblind, another study and be, because they'll have access to unblinded records. So that's something that we're working on right now to figure out so that you can have multiple people work on multiple studies, but it may end up that we land on internal people also need to be provided access on a study by study level, at least the study managers, those people mm -hmm. that need both, you know, unblinded or blinded access. Mm -hmm. that, that's really interesting, Allison. Um, is it okay if I step in, Karen? Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because it's it's uh, that is uh, a, a nice model um, to have. We have struggled with that as well, and we don't we don't really differentiate. Um, we don't have anyone who has access across the board, right? It's always at a study level, and that has been our our challenge is is managing study by study because each each group, you know, the subset of folks who have access to the unblinding documents will vary um, across across the studies so mm -hmm. okay that's good uh, to know so that was one of the one of the questions that i was going to come to but i'd like to go if you don't mind go to paul first for your sort of yeah. overview but it's <laughs> specifically around user management i think it's that's one of the yeah i think that's challenges. that's always the biggest challenge in my opinion is is the user management and I think that first, first of all, uh, it's really important to think about your process and, and it's not just technical controls, it's also procedural controls and training and educating people on what is an unblinded document and you know, what's the process around it. Um, what Alison was talking about, sort of having like uh, you know, dedicated individuals who are, who are sort of unblinded um, uh, in the system. I mean, I've seen that before uh, where you know everything that they upload is 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 actually protected, and it doesn't matter if it's an unblinded uh, type of document or not. Um, the, the the problem with that obviously is that some people, um, you know, let's say for example a statistician, they may be unblinded in the study, but that means that everything they upload, including the SAP and everything else, is also blinded automatically in the study. So it's kind of it can become uh, problematic when you're trying to share content that, that really should be shared with the, with the study team. Um, so one thing that, uh, there's actually two things that I'm thinking about um, which could potentially solve the issue. The first is if you have a, an, an individual that, that's blinded or unblinded, rather unblinded, um, you know, maybe you have like an intermediate step where their content is held in a holding tank until somebody actually goes and looks at it and says, yes, yes, this is blinded uh, material and needs to be protected, or this can be distributed to anybody who has access right in this particular processor. The other thing I'm thinking about is, um, you know, how do we avoid or how do we detect errors? Mm -hmm. um, so, so documents being um, uploaded into the system and, and incorrectly classified and therefore uh, unblinding uh, inadvertently the study. Uh, and one thing that I've been thinking about and looking at quite a lot recently, as, as it, you know, a lot of people in the industry have, is maybe using in artificial intelligence where we can actually look at a document and maybe detect what type of document is that. Uh, and typically is that document therefore, uh, you know, a blinded or unblinded document and sort of have, you know, maybe some safeguards like that in place um, to try and detect the errors. But I, I do think that you know we're always going to have that risk because I, even AI it's not it's not perfect. Uh, so we also need to think about the procedures. You know what do we do procedurally to make sure that we're controlling this. But there are definitely a lot of benefits to having that content in the TMF, mm -hmm. definitely in terms of traceability, so in terms of you know inspections and all of those things. And um, there's a lot of benefits, but uh, we need to uh, to get the user management part right. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, Paul, I would completely agree with you. That was one of, one of the things I was thinking is that it's the roles and that that's the, the biggest challenge. I, I'd just actually like to go back because Ken, you asked a really good question, which is there a standard definition of blinded and unblinded? And I, I don't know if there's anything specific. I'm not the regulation queen. 
um, uh, the the for me a blinded or unblinded and unblinded document and and this gets very confusing because people yeah. talk about blinded and unblinded but actually unblinded is the bad one and blinded <laughs> is the good one but actually it's, <laughs> it's it's the most crazy way around because it's actually the yeah. unblinded document unblinds you so basically an unblinded yeah. document maybe tells you something about who's on what medication <laughs> um or whatever but it so the words get very very confusing and i remember yeah. our technical people and our tmf people having different understandings because technically yeah. it doesn't make any sense to use <laughs> right. the word unblinded think about um, think about if you're a person who doesn't have sight and you've volunteered for a, a trial in a medication for that purpose um, we like the term restricted and unrestricted mm -hmm. because of the following fact many sponsors hold other material that ha don't have anything to do with the human heroes who participate in the trials contracts financial records in in device trials yeah. there's sometimes design plans there's a there's a world of sensitivity and sometimes it's very trial specific and yeah. blinded mm -hmm. means a lot of different things to a lot of different people yeah. Yeah, actually, in uh, in studies where you're you're testing blindness as well on yeah. on patients, it's, there's a sensitivity there as well. Oh, yeah, we, we use the term masks, right? In in yep. ophthalmology, yep. we can use the term blinded. But I, I like what Bran is saying: the whole concept of restricted. Yeah. Uh, not, I think that that's actually much clearer cut because mm -hmm. even when I was talking, I'm saying blinding, I'm blinding. It's very confusing. Very very confusing. Yeah. And uh, of course. I think we should uh, we should change the terminology for sure. Yeah. So so one thing that we do is we have uh, we have levels of restriction. So to Fran's point and Paul, your point, we have I think three levels of restriction depending on what it is, right? So contracts or other materials that need to be restricted because they're sensitive, but they're not unblinding, right? They're not going to unblind the trial. So we we differentiate those. Um, uh, those areas so that we can clearly see, you know, what kinds of documents we call potentially unblinding. Uh, so we, we flag those as, as the potential to unblind and, and then protect those differently than we might protect a contract or some other yeah. kind of document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a million questions. So guys, I'm gonna actually just go into the questions. So I'm gonna start with you, Mary, and I'll, I'll try and filter through them and see what I make sure I catch everything. So Mary, there was a question for you, um, and and I, I don't know whether Kathy, you want to ask the question, or do you want me to just ask, should I just ask it for you? Would you want to ask it? You need to mute. Yeah, no, yeah. Why don't you just, Why don't you just ask it, oh, Karen? Okay, no worries at all. Um, so the question was about how you manage completeness for unblinded documents if they're not in the ETMF. Yeah. How do you How do you know because they're in this other separate restricted um, validated repository thing? Right. So what, what we do is for all of those placeholders, the milestone is final tables. So we would not uh, flag those as being late uh, because we won't expect them until final tables. So basically after database is, is unlocked. Mary, would that be true even if a document type was sometimes unblinded and sometimes blinded? Well, so we, we the, the what we do is... Type, yeah. We say potentially unblinding. So we, we have a set of uh, document types or artifacts that we consider potentially unblinding, whether that specific document is actually unblinding, we don't assess because our timeliness ah. metric should, should take care of that in terms of contemporaneous filing. And what we, what we do is we say, can these documents be filed on a study by study basis will indicate, yes, it can be filed contemporaneously or no, it's going to be in a separate repository. So that's, that's how we um, monitor that for an individual study. Thanks, that's, that's clear. Another question, I think a really good question, Kathy, is around um, access to the health authority inspectors. Do you always give them access to the unblinded, restricted, whatever you want to call them, documents? I guess that's probably to Alison and Mary more than anybody. Yeah, I think it depends on when the inspection's happening. If it's like an active study and I don't know, we haven't, I don't think we've really had that experience just yet, but I would think with an active study, you have to kind of be 
aware of that and kind of have some kind of discussion ahead of time? Because if the inspectors are interviewing and discussing with the blinded active team, there could be a risk there, I guess. But mm -hmm. after a study's over, most of the stuff's moved to that blinded state anyways, and the inspector's not really needing access to unblinded stuff. So it's kind of merged in with the rest of the, the uh, TMF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our approach is similar, Allison. We would, uh, if the study is, is complete, we would open up access to inspectors and they can access just like they would access any other document. But for if if we're reading out on an interim, we've got a you know interim results inspection or something, then um, I think we would treat that on a case by case basis because technically it it's locked. It would be restricted still. I guess I, I wonder whether that it goes back to a point um, made by Ashley right at miles up the chat, which was it depends. Mm -hmm. So you know, for example, the monitoring stuff, you might allow them to see the unblinded monitoring reports at, at, at a particular situation, but you might not want them to see the randomization list. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it goes back to how documents get put into the system. Sometimes it will depend on the type of documents as to whether they go in on an ongoing basis. I mean, statisticians are notoriously scared about letting go of their randomization list. So yeah. the chance of them putting it into a system is a lot lower than a monitoring visit report going into the system. I mean, for in the IRT world, which is obviously really focused on, on maintaining blind, yeah. um, sometimes you have to sort of provide access to just one subject's uh, information. Um, and usually in systems, you have a mechanism by, where you can, it's, it's almost like temporarily unblinding certain information which is destined to one specific user. Um, and so I think in, in the TMF world, we don't, we don't really focus that much on blinding, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's sort of one, one area out of many that we need to look at. Yeah. Um, but we don't have specific tools necessarily that, um, that are very sort of evolved around the management of the blind. Um, but I think that a really interesting tool to have, especially for inspections, or even if you have like say a safety case and you need to be able to provide access to one record to one individual for a temporary period of time is that ability of being able to to sort of send that record or send a link uh, and then also maybe pro provide some rationale as to why you're doing it and um, so that there's some traceability as well but having like that that uh, that ability to to provide it in a secure manner with rationale i think could be really interesting uh, mm -hmm. feature of the tmf system especially as we're doing more and more sort of uh, etmf based inspections Absolutely. I think if, if everybody takes the time to read the chat, it's a really interesting sort of run. And what I'll do is I'll actually put some of this into some of the slides so that people can go back and read it. Because there's really interesting different ways that people are managing users where you've got uh, somebody who is the unblinded user uploads and then there's an unblinded QCer who checks it. Um, I know we've seen where you have people that have the ability to upload. Um, and people who have the ability to see, but not necessarily both. So maybe they can only see the unblinded, but another role gives them the upload. So I think there's lots and lots of flexibility about how you could do this. Um, and I think Sharon's got an interesting point where the, the biometrics team have password protected documents put into the ETMF, um, which is great at the time from a sort of double security step, but then obviously thinking about longer term archiving and how do you get through those for you to get the passwords etc so i think there's just a lot of different ways in which people are effectively managing um uh, all the different documents um so i'm just looking at the other thing I, just a quick comment for those of you who wanted to know elvin thank you i knew i could rely on you to come up with the the, the definition of blinding um however that makes it even more confusing because the definition of blinding is a procedure to which makes one or party one or more parties of the trial are kept unaware of the treatment. However, we call them unblinding documents. So we really have caused a lot of confusion with mm. terminology. And of course, the risk of someone getting it the wrong way around is huge because that just throws everything. So um, okay, so um, I'm going to just as a quick comment, there's a there is a, a, um, a question, Ken, that you've put um around managing bias in uncontrolled or single armed studies um i don't know whether anyone's going to have any 
comments to make on that. I will leave you guys to on the on the panel to have a look at that. And if you've got anything that you want to, or if anybody else on the team would like to comment back to Ken, that would be much appreciated. Um, and I am just sorry, there's just so many comments. Um, in a study that is not blinded, what kind of access is given to users? So in other words, in an open study, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that the documents aren't labeled as unblinded, so therefore everyone can see everything apart from the sensitive documents, like the contracts mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, we give just standard blinded access. That's the default kind of, if you will, access. Um, we just won't have anybody with unblinded access uh, added to that study. Yep, the same okay. with us. We're, yeah, there's no difference. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And we, we outline all of it in our TMF study management plan. So the approach, you know, to Allison's point is, is um, outlined first in that in the management plan, which really conforms to the, the template that uh, is available with the TMF reference model. There are a couple of interesting comments from Adam regarding uh, the ways in which they man he manages his ETMF um, about people opening documents. But I'd like to go to Varendra's question, which is an interesting one. Do you give unblinded document access to all central TMF document processing teams? So for example, let's say you have a process whereby the end user uploads the documents, they mark them as, as, as um, um, uh, 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 they add the metadata and it goes into a central either indexing or QC team and it's a small team it's five people uh, you know I'm just sort of coming up with a scenario would you would everybody who has access to that study have access to those unblinded documents to QC them as part of the run of the mill or do you have specific users who QC the unblinded documents and that actually there's a couple of questions a few Parts up a couple of people commented on this, but I wondered, Mary and Alison, whether you have specific people QCing unblinded documents. I believe we give everybody in our process team uh, dual access. Um, because in our main thinking on that, it uh, too is um, at least our internal people. Um, is that they're not assigned study team members. So they don't attend the study team. They don't make any decisions on the study. So they can have access to both blinded and unblinded. Mm -hmm. it, for us, um, for the, the non-ETMF validated repository, that is not accessed by our TMF uh, central filing, the, the folks who process the documents, but our TMF study owners and some of the TMF ops group do have access and monitor that. Um, but for the standard ETMF, uh, it's all of the, the filing team who has access. I have to say that that's what I've seen across lots of different clients is when you've got a small TMF team that are just doing, they're not part of the study, they're just processing documents, they have access to all. I, um, I think somebody further up the chat said they had unblinding people QCing unblinding documents, but that's not what I've normally seen. Um, um, there was a question that Ken asked about, does anyone use data access plans? And again, if anybody, Ken's details are in the, in the email, in the email, if anybody has, would like to um, go back to Ken and talk to him about it, or if anybody's got any comments. Um, I'm just seeing if there's anything else. Um, a question, how can a records manager know they're unblinded documents? Well, it should be in the TMF plan for a start, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, I guess it's the, it's the question, is this an unblinded document or that there are unblinded documents? Because I agree if it's, if it's that there are, which is what, how the question is worded, then it should be in the TMF plan, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, that is absolutely brilliant. Um, I am going to capture this chat somehow. Um, and oh, I think I can do it just by hang on, I'm just gonna just just 
press open on Google Drive because it's going to open the chat and then I've not lost it. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to take the chat and sort of merge it down because there were some fantastic things that were said in this chat. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Mary and Paul and Alison. I think it's a great idea to have um, a sort of an open chat like this on a particular topic. If anybody um, would like to suggest a topic, uh, feel free to email me or put it in the chat or whatever, um, and we'll try and do a few more of these. Uh, just as a, in the last minute, just as a quick reminder, because I think I'm still sharing my slides, there are three conferences coming up, HSRAA, virtual September, TMF Summit, New Orleans, October. Um, we're all going to try and be in New Orleans, so um, it, will, it should be fantastic fun. Um, and then Clinical Document World in New Jersey, probably easier to get to, um, um, and that's in November. So they're the ones that I know of. Obviously, there's DIA coming up, but there's not a lot of TMF stuff at DIA in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and the last but not least, at, with about 30 seconds to go, the next meeting is on the 19th of July, um, just before everyone goes off on holiday. Um, and um, we will let you know what topics are gonna be. We've got a few exciting things going on in the reference model at the moment, so we will come back to you with that. So without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Have a nice day. Enjoy your thank evening, you. afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Thank Bye. you. Bye.